This is an introduction to machine learning safety, and now let's discuss deep learning preliminaries. First, in our discussion of model building blocks, we'll talk about residual connections and normalization techniques. Then we'll move on to nonlinear components of neural networks, and finally talk about entire neural network architectures such as transformers. Model building blocks have their parameters adjusted through losses. Some of these losses are information theoretic losses, such as cross entropy. There are other losses, such as L2 regularization, which prevent the parameters from blowing up in size. Model building block parameters are adjusted to achieve a lower loss. These adjustments are made by optimizers, so we'll discuss some of the main optimizers, including Atom. Then we'll discuss learning rate schedulers, which help stabilize optimization. Deep networks require data sets. We'll discuss vision data sets, such as CIFAR-10 and ImageNet, and we'll discuss text data sets, such as Glue. Let's now discuss model building blocks. Our first building block are residual connections. Residual connections are a fairly general purpose building block. They can be used in many different problem settings, such as vision, speech, or natural language processing. And they can be used in many different architectures, such as ResNets, transformers, or multilayer perceptrons. So in this way, they're fairly general purpose. To understand and motivate residual connections, let's look at a feed-forward network without any residual connections and see what complications may arise. Say that layer L has some defective feature map F. The feature map might be highly contractive and suppress or destroy the signal X sub L. This could happen possibly through an incorrect update during backpropagation, or perhaps the network was poorly randomly initialized. Then the output of layer L will be very small, and that will destroy the computation throughout the rest of the feedforward pass. Let's see how residual connections can improve this picture. With residual connections, we don't just have f of x. Instead, the activations are f of x plus the original input x. So consequently, if f happened to destroy the signal by making it really small, the signal is still preserved because we're adding back the original input. Another important building block is layer normalization. Layer normalization, also called layer norm, reduces the chance of feedforward signals magnitude from blowing up or decaying. Let's write out layer normalization. First, let's assume that the activation is living in an h-dimensional space, and it's representing the values of layer L. Layer norm will first standardize the Lth layer's activations by making it have a zero mean and a standard deviation of one. Even though layer normalization is called layer normalization, you're actually standardizing rather than normalizing by the magnitude of the vector. So what we need to do is we need to compute the mean of the activations, and we need to compute the standard deviation of the activations. Mu and sigma are not saved. They're computed on the fly with each feed forward. With mu and sigma, Layer normalization can take the standardized activation and then apply an affine transformation with a learned scale and learned shift parameter. The learned scale parameter is gamma and the learned shift parameter is beta, which are also h-dimensional. So we've subtracted the mean from the activation and we've divided by the standard deviation. And then we're multiplying by gamma and adding beta. That dot thing is element-wise multiplication. Gamma and beta are learned parameters, and they don't depend on the activations. Meanwhile, sigma and mu are not learned parameters, and they depend on the activations. The take-home intuition for layer normalization can simply be that it aids optimization. It doesn't make the features more expressive. It just helps optimization proceed more stably. Batch normalization is a similar building block. Batch normalization, or batch norm, also reduces the chance of the feedforward signal's magnitude from blowing up or decaying. Batch norm is like layer norm, except its mean and sigma are aggregated across B examples in the batch. It's not aggregated across 
the activations. Here's a juxtaposition between batch norm and layer norm. As we can see, batch norm is aggregating across examples, whereas layer norm is aggregating across the channels and the height and width of those channels. This is a visualization for confidence. It isn't the case for things like multilayer perceptrons. But hopefully this gives an intuition of the difference between batch norm and layer norm. Let's look at batch normalization in more detail. We need to compute the mean and standard deviation. So the mean at the ith dimension is the activations at the ith dimension, but averaged over all of the B examples. The standard deviation is defined similarly. Batch normalization usually works well with sizable batch sizes that are greater than one. If the batch size was just one, the standard deviation would be zero. And we can't divide by zero when we're trying to standardize by the standard deviation. So batch norm needs larger batch sizes. If the batch size is just moderately sized, we could have a poor estimate of the mean and standard deviation, which would be quite a problem. So batch normalization tends to require larger batches. But this can become a problem because that could create memory constraints. When we're using very large models, sometimes we might just want to feed forward one example at a time. Batch norm is not very suitable for this purpose. In contrast, layer norm can work with one example at a time. So it's often used for very large models. Both layer norm and batch normalization can make it easier to use larger learning rates. That's because both of them stabilize optimization. Now researchers use both batch norm and layer normalization, but layer normalization is more common in recent architectures such as transformers, so it's becoming more popular. An important neural network regularizer is dropout. Dropout randomly sets some activations to zero during training. It's often not used during test time because we want deterministic evaluation during test time, so as to reduce evaluation noise. It's also the case that models tend to be weaker when dropout is on because they're not at their full functionality. So that's another reason not to have dropout on during test time. We can define dropout somewhat more formally. We could assume that B is a random Bernoulli mask vector. B is h-dimensional, and each entry in that vector, or each dimension of that vector, are sampled from a Bernoulli distribution following probability p. I should note that these probabilities tend not to get too low. That is, the masking probabilities tend not to dip below 50%. You're not going to have something like 90% of the neurons masked. That's very uncommon in practice. In fact, usually not more than 50% of the neurons are masked in practice. Dropout element-wise multiplies the activations by the B mask. And then we adjust by the probability 1 minus P to preserve the expectation. If we didn't preserve the expectation, if we didn't divide by 1 minus P, then the activations would tend to get a lot smaller. So this is why we divide by 1 minus P. Dropout encourages redundant feature detectors. So if one of the activations fails, error is masked, then another neuron needs to pick up the slack. It needs to learn the function that the other neuron was learning. Consequently, if one of the neurons failed during test time, then we can rely on another neuron to have detected that feature. This is how dropout can encourage redundancy, and that can help improve representations. It can also limit the extent to which neurons learn some fairly finicky features or very fragile ones. Because without this sort of injection of Bernoulli noise, they could end up learning some fairly complicated functions. But they can't conspire in the same way if they're potentially going to be masked out. Since a neuron's interconnections during training keep changing, the neuron is forced to learn simpler, more compatible, and less idiosyncratic features. Let's now turn to activation functions. The sigmoid activation function is a simple one. It's equal to 1 over 1 plus e to the negative x. Note that sigma symbol there doesn't mean standard deviation. That's just how we write the sigmoid function. To appreciate the sigmoid function, let's zoom out for a second. 
In the brain, there are activations. And when a feature is detected, a neuron fires. There's a coarse description of what goes on. A step function emulates detection firing. However, that is not differentiable if it's either on or off. The sigmoid is a differentiable approximation to the step function. The sigmoid then can be likened to a neuron firing probability. So that's an interpretation of what the sigmoid is about. And the sigmoid is even used today. It's used in LSTMs, and it's used as the output of probabilistic binary classifiers. Another seminal activation is the ReLU activation. It is the maximum of 0 and x. So, if the input is negative, then the output is 0. And if the input is positive, then the output is the same as the input. ReLU stands for Rectified Linear Unit. Rectification is when you throw away the negative signal. Although the ReLU is not always smooth, it is differentiable almost everywhere. So we can write the derivative as the indicator that x is greater than 0. The ReLU can be interpreted as gating inputs based on their sign. If x is positive, let it through and otherwise filter it. An activation that is smoother than the ReLU is the JELU. The JELU is x times 5x, where phi is the CDF of the standard normal distribution. JELU stands for Gaussian Error Linear Units, which is a backronym. The CDF is computed with something called the error functions. That's where the word error comes from. The JELU uses Gaussians, or it makes a Gaussian distribution assumption because of the central limit theorem. So since Gaussians are so common, that's why there's a Gaussian assumption. The JELU is used in most state-of-the-art deep learning models, such as BERT, GPT, vision transformers, etc. The JELU can also be interpreted as the expected value of, the, of a process where a neuron with value x is gated with one probability 1 minus 5 of x. So smaller inputs are more likely to be gated. So we multiply phi of x multiply by the identity of x, or it's gated with probability 1 minus 5 of x. The expected value of that is x times 5 of x. Let's juxtapose the ReLU and the JELU. The ReLU is a linear function multiplied by a step function. Meanwhile, the JELU is a linear function multiplied by a smooth approximation to the step function. That gives us the JELU. We use a Gaussian approximation to the step function as opposed to a sigmoidal one because of the central limit theorem. However, we could also use a sigmoidal one. In the same JELU paper, we also introduced the CLU activation function, x times sigmoid of x. In this way, we can see that the JELU weights the input by its size. It doesn't gate by the sign. The ReLU gates by the sign. Here is a visualization of these element-wise activation functions. As we can see, the ReLU and JELU continue to grow for positive inputs. Meanwhile, the sigmoid is lower bounded by 0 and upper bounded by 1, and it has vanishing gradients at its extreme values. However, for some inputs, the gradients are small for each of these activations. For example, the sigmoid has a fairly small gradient at around negative 2 and below, the ReLU has a zero gradient everywhere below zero, and the JELU has a small gradient for negative two and below. So consequently, small gradients don't necessarily determine the performance of an activation function. The most popular non-element-wise activation function is the softmax. It converts inputs, also called logits, into probability distributions. So it takes a k-dimensional real-valued input and outputs a k-dimensional probability distribution. The softmax at the ith dimension is equal to e to the x sub i over the sum of the exponentials of the logits. The reason for this form is a statistical reason. If you assume a categorical distribution, this follows naturally from statistics from exponential families. The softmax vector sums to 1, 
and has non-negative values. The softmax is frequently used for classifying k-classes or creating values for a weighted average or convex combination. The softmax can be thought of as a higher dimensional version of a sigmoid. To see this, look at the following. If we compute the sigmoid of x minus y, then we can multiply the numerator and denominator by e to the x, and that's the first dimension of a two-dimensional sigmoid. These building blocks can be used to make neural network architectures. A basic architecture is a multilayer perceptron. Multilayer perceptrons, or MLPs, are usually weight matrices, activations, and an input composed together. Here's an example multilayer perceptron with one layer. It's a weight matrix multiplied by the input, and that is processed through an activation function, which is then multiplied by another weight matrix. Consequently, MLPs are often activations interleaved with matrix multiplications. An alternative to matrix multiplication is convolution. Since many useful data features may be local, we can move a sliding window feature detector, or kernel, across an input to help detect such features. In machine learning, this is called convolution. We take the kernel, we could say that the kernel is 0, 1, 2, 2, 2, 0, 0, 1, 2, and perform an inner product with the input. Then that can result in lots of different entries as we slide through the input. Convolution is often used in hidden layers, and they use few parameters by repeatedly reapplying the kernels across the entire input. Convolution is translation equivariant. So if an input shifts over by one pixel to the right, we might need to relearn an entire weight matrix if we were trying to process that input through matrix multiplication. However, if we're using convolution, the kernel can just slide one pixel over to the right as well, and then the computation can proceed as before. In this way, convolutions are more appropriate for features that might be translated across an image or might appear in different spatial locations but still have the same meaning. Let's look at two neural network architectures separated by many years in time. ResNet is from 2015, and Convnext is from 2022. Here's the ResNet block, and here's a Convnext block. These blocks define each of the network's layers and are stacked together to define the entire network. As we can see, both networks use residual connections. However, Convnext uses layer normalization instead of batch normalization and uses GELUs rather than RELUs. There are some other changes behind Convnext. It uses a cosine learning rate schedule, which we'll talk about later. It uses Atom, which we'll talk about later. And it uses aggressive data augmentation, which we'll talk about in a separate lecture. The ultimate impact of these changes is an increase in ImageNet accuracy. In short, Convnext summarizes the best training practices and architectural modifications from the past seven years. Self-attention is another important building block of modern neural networks. It's got queries, keys, and values. The queries are multiplied by the keys and then divided by a scaling parameter. That's then fed into a softmax, which is then multiplied by the values. We won't give a more thorough treatment of self-attention in this lecture, since it might require substantially more time to appropriately cover. An architecture that's crucial to know due to its high generality is the transformer. A transformer is a sequence of transformer blocks, so let's describe one of those blocks. We have these input tokens, x sub 1 through x sub 4. They're processed through self-attention. And then there's residual connection and layer normalization. Then it's applied through multilayer perceptrons. Then it's applied through residual connection and layer normalization again, which gives us the output. This defines a transformer block, which is basically self-attention followed by multilayer perceptrons with things that help with optimization in between. That is the residual connection and layer normalization. These blocks can be stacked together, and they give us the transformer. Transformers are highly parallelizable. We don't require 
processing the tokens in sequence. We can do a single feed forward pass, and we don't need to wait for the left tokens to be processed before processing the right tokens. Transformers can be made highly competitive in arbitrary data modalities, which highlights their importance. Now let's discuss losses, which steer the training of deep learning models. Behind many information theoretic losses is the minimum description length principle. The minimum description length principle views learning as data compression. So if events can be described more succinctly, that's evidence of heightened understanding. While if events are described in a very long-winded way, that suggests that there isn't much understanding of what's going on. Imagine that we wanted to encode sequences of A's, B's, and C's. So the probability mass on A is 50%. The probability mass of the B token is 25%. And the remaining probability mass for C is 25%. We can give higher probability events shorter descriptions so that the coding scheme is more efficient. If we encoded A with 1, 1 and C with 1, then the more probable events or sequences would require longer descriptions compared to if we encoded A with 1, B with 1, 0, and C with 1, 1. Notice that if we use that more efficient encoding scheme, then the description length of the symbol is the negative log base 2 of the probability of that symbol. Consequently, negative log base 2 of 50% is 1, and negative log base 2 of 25% is 2. This establishes a relation between the negative log probability, which we often use in machine learning, and a description length. In machine learning, we often implicitly select the model that has the shortest description length or the shortest encoding of the data because we often select the model with the smallest log loss. Now, I'll note that we've been glossing over many details, but with the minimum description length, we can view learning as data compression. With the minimum description length principle described, we can now turn to some of the information theoretic losses. A basic one is entropy. If the ith symbol has probability p sub i and its encoding size is negative log of p sub i, the expected code length is the entropy. Note that we're using a differentiable approximation to the negative of the ceiling of the log probability. When we're talking about encoding size, it doesn't make as much sense to talk about a fractional code length, hence the ceiling, but we're using a smooth approximation. So we're just talking about negative log probability. Then, following the minimum description length principle, we can select models that minimize the entropy. Researchers often use the entropy as a loss for generative models. Another way of looking at entropy is thinking of it as a measure of a random variable's randomness, stochasticity, or uncertainty. At the right, we show the entropy of a Bernoulli variable. Notice the entropy is maximized when the distribution is uniform. That is when b equals 1 minus b equals 0 0.5. And when b is equal to 1 or 0, there isn't any uncertainty in the variable's outcome. The entropy is 0 in that case. While the entropy is a function of one distribution, the cross entropy is a function of two. The cross entropy measures the difference between two different distributions. The cross entropy measures the average number of bits needed to encode events that occur following the probability distribution P if a coding scheme is used that is optimal for the probability distribution Q. We mentioned bits, but we could mention nats if we were taking log base e as opposed to log base 2. The cross entropy is commonly used for classifiers, which encode the conditional distribution y given x. So instead of modeling the distribution x, you're modeling the conditional distribution y given x. Let's look at various properties of the cross entropy function. If p is 1 hot, which is to say, if there exists an i such that p sub i is equal to 1, 
and all the other probabilities are consequently zero, then the cross entropy from Q to P is not equal to that entire sum, but actually just equal to negative log of Q sub I, because all of the other parts of the sum were multiplied by zero. Another property is that the cross entropy is infinite if there exists an I such that Q sub I is equal to zero when P sub I is not equal to zero. That's because the negative log of zero is unboundedly high. So that's how the cross entropy can diverge. Another important property is that the cross entropy is not symmetric. Although the cross entropy measures the difference between two distributions, it's not symmetric. That's because P log Q is not equal to Q log P. Another reason is that the cross entropy can be interpreted as using the encoding scheme that's optimal for probability distribution Q, but the events are actually following probability distribution P. That would not be the same as if we're using the optimal encoding scheme for distribution P, but the events are actually following distribution Q. Finally, the cross entropy can be related to the entropy. The cross entropy from P to P is simply the entropy of P. Let's look at another loss, the KL divergence, which is also called the relative entropy since it compares two entropies. The Kullback Leibler divergence measures the difference between two distributions. Let's look at various properties of the KL divergence to understand it better. First, if P is 1 hot, which is to say there exists an I such that P sub I is equal to 1, then the KL divergence from Q to P is equal to negative log Q sub I. So in this case, the KL divergence is like the cross entropy. As before, the KL divergence is infinite if there exists an I such that Q sub I is equal to 0 when P sub I is non-zero. Likewise, the KL divergence is not symmetric. The KL divergence from Q to P is not equal to the KL divergence from P to Q. We can also relate the KL divergence to cross entropies and entropies. The KL divergence from Q to P is equal to the cross entropy from Q to P minus the entropy of P. This is how I think of the KL divergence formula. An abstract verbal description of the KL divergence is as follows. If we encode messages with an optimal encoding scheme for distribution Q, but the true distribution is actually P, then each message requires, on average, an additional KL from Q to P bits to be encoded compared to the optimal encoding. So the KL divergence is measuring the inefficiency because we're using an inefficient encoding. This is why we're subtracting between the cross entry from Q to P minus the entropy of P. The entropy of P is talking about the optimal encoding for P. Meanwhile, the cross entry from Q to P is telling us about a suboptimal encoding for P. That difference is the KL divergence. Another important loss is L2 regularization. This penalizes the model complexity by adding the model parameter norm to the loss function. The regularization strength of L2 regularization is scaled by lambda. So when we're not regularizing, we might have a very complicated function. In the example at the right, we have samples that are generated by a true function plus noise. The model, when it's not regularized, turns out to be very complicated. But when we do L2 regularization and let lambda be non-zero, then we get a simpler function. As it happens, and I won't get into the details, a probabilistic interpretation is that the L2 regularization incorporates a Gaussian prior over the parameters. The prior has mean zero and a variance inversely proportional to lambda. So as lambda gets larger, the prior is that the weights should be closer and closer to zero. This is also a reason for preferring L2 regularization. If we were doing L1 regularization, we would be assuming a Laplacian prior over the parameters, which is somewhat unnatural. The L2 regularization can be interpreted in a different way. It can be interpreted as penalizing the bits required to encode the parameters. So a larger L2 norm would correspond to more bits, 
and if the norm is smaller or shrunk by L2 regularization, then there are fewer bits required to encode the parameters. That means a shorter description length. These losses are decreased with the help of optimizers. Let's now talk about various tools in optimization. A basic but powerful optimizer is stochastic gradient descent. With SGD, we optimize the parameters theta using the loss function L by iteratively moving in the direction of steepest descent with step size alpha. That is to say, theta sub k plus 1 is equal to the parameters of the previous step, theta sub k, minus alpha times the gradient of the loss, so alpha is modulating the step size. Note that some take stochastic gradient descent to mean that we're just using a batch size 1, but in this lecture, we're using the term more generally. Neural network optimizers are based around ideas behind gradient descent, but they rarely use this exact formulation. They tend to use a somewhat more complicated optimizer. That said, neural networks are optimized with a local search or greedy method. The models learn from many small incremental changes. They don't learn with radical sudden changes. That doesn't teach the networks to learn useful representations. And likewise, neural networks are not taught by hand-chosen parameters. A human is not intervening in choosing what the neuron should be. That sort of top-down design where humans are getting involved doesn't really work that well either. So local search is what actually works. Here's a simple example of SGD. The optimizer starts in the top right corner and takes a step, and then another step, and it can take many more steps until it gets to the local minima. At the same time, the model is learning a better representation of the data. It's learning better parameters that fit the data and produces a better line. This is a simple example of SGD working quickly. In many other problems, estimation noise becomes more of an issue. Consequently, to reduce gradient estimation noise during optimization, researchers often use something called momentum, which is equivalent to moving in the direction of the moving average of the gradient. So we let the gradient equal the loss plus mu times the gradient from the previous step. And then we update the parameters to be the previous parameters minus alpha times that gradient estimate. Mu, I should note here, is a fixed constant, which is less than 1. The gradients farther in the past have exponentially less weight. So old gradients die out, and so the optimizer can quickly adapt. That's because as the optimizer continues through training, the older gradients are less relevant. That's because as the optimizer moves along the loss landscape, the directions that were useful far in the past aren't necessarily useful anymore. So consequently, we want to give priority to the more recent gradients. Atom is another important optimization algorithm. The basic idea behind Atom is to combine the insights from momentum and then apply it to also have a second moment adjustment. I'll explain what that means in a moment. The first moment is momentum-like. So m sub k is equal to the previous m sub k estimate decayed by beta sub 1. And then we add that to 1 minus beta sub 1 multiplied by the gradient. So that's acting like an exponential moving average of the gradients. Now let's look at the second moment estimate. The second moment is equal to the previous estimate of the second moment mixed in with the element-wise square of the gradient of the loss. One could think of this as being a rough approximation of the squared length of each dimension of the gradient of the loss. These first and second moment estimates are initialized to zero. But that could end up biasing the estimate towards zero. So early on, m and v values will be small. But if we divide by 1 minus beta sub 1 to the k, or 1 minus beta sub 2 to the k, this adjusts those estimates and blows them up a bit for small k. This counteracts their bias towards zero. Then the parameters are updated as follows. Theta sub k equals the previous parameters minus alpha times, and it's not the gradient that we're moving in the direction of, 
we're moving in that bias adjusted estimate of the first moment, but then we're going to divide by something similar to the magnitude of the second moment. Consequently, if the gradient is very large in one dimension, then when we divide by the square root of the bias adjusted second moment estimate, the large size is counteracted by that division. Therefore, the optimizer is moving a similar amount in each dimension. A nice property about Atom is that it's fairly robust to hyperparameters. It is good default settings, where alpha equals 0.001, epsilon is 10 to the negative 8, beta sub 1, or the momentum-like parameter, is 0.9, and beta sub 2 is equal to 0.999. As an aside, and we won't get into much detail, researchers often use atom w instead of atom. If we use atom with L2 regularization, we have line 6. We have the gradient plus lambda times the parameters. But then the parameters end up affecting the second moment estimate. And so on line 12, when we're updating the parameters, since we're dividing by the second moment estimate, it's as though we're dividing by the parameters. That ends up creating some unintended consequences. So what people do is they use atom w, where instead of adding lambda times the parameters on line 6, they end up adding it on line 12. In short, if we incorporate L2 regularization at this step, M and V keep track of the regularization gradients. Atom W decouples regularization from M and V. Let's discuss learning rate schedulers. Learning rates are not always constant. They often decay following a schedule. The linear decay schedule decays the learning rate at a constant amount each iteration. So it decreases from an initial learning rate down to a smaller value. Another learning rate scheduler, which is very useful, is the cosine annealing schedule. It decays the learning rate proportional to the cosine function from 0 to pi. So there's an initial learning rate, and it decays down to 0. There are other learning rate schedulers, but they tend not to be as performant as the cosine learning rate scheduler. For example, people have proposed having the learning rate decay exponentially. Others have proposed making the learning rate decay in proportion to 1 over the square root of the number of steps. And they have some theoretical reasons for this. But overall, in practice, the cosine learning rate scheduler tends to work very well and reliably. Finally, let's talk about some of the data sets that are commonly used in deep learning research. CIFAR-10 and CIFAR-100 are great rapid experimentation data sets. As you can see, CIFAR-10 has 10 classes. It has airplane, automobile, bird, cat, deer, dog, frog, horse, ship, truck. Each image in CIFAR-10 and CIFAR-100 is small. They're 32 by 32 by 3 images. Since they're so small, this is what can enable them to be useful for rapid experimentation. If they are much larger, then they would require a lot more computation to experiment with. Each dataset of CIFAR-10 and CIFAR-100 has 50,000 training images and 10,000 test images. As noted before, there are two CIFAR variants. CIFAR-10 has 10 classes, and CIFAR-100 has 100 classes. It's worth mentioning that their classes are mutually exclusive. A larger scale dataset is ImageNet. ImageNet has full-sized images covering 1,000 classes. Some examples from the ImageNet dataset are at the right, as well as predictions by a model on each of those examples. ImageNet has 1.2 million training examples and 50,000 labeled evaluation examples. That means it has 50 examples per class, which might seem fairly small, but since we have 50,000 labeled evaluation examples, that means we can get a good estimate of the test accuracy. ImageNet 22K is a larger version with approximately 22,000 classes and roughly 10 times the number of training examples. It's worth mentioning that ConvNets that are pre-trained on ImageNet 
tend to have strong visual representations, so people often pre-train their model on ImageNet and then fine-tune it on other tasks. Some natural language processing datasets that are useful for rapid experimentation are SST2 and IMDB. These are NLP datasets for binary sentiment analysis of movie reviews. SST2 contains pithy professional expert movie reviews, and IMDB contains full-length lay or amateur movie reviews. Here's an SST2 example. We can see it's very pithy. And here's an IMDB example. We can see it tends to be somewhat longer. The sentiment of the left example is positive, and the sentiment of the right example is negative. Some datasets that are harder and more computationally expensive are Glue and Superglue. These benchmarks aggregate NLP model performance over several tasks, such as sentiment analysis and natural language inference. Consequently, they give an overall summary of a model's natural language understanding. Superglue is harder than glue but state-of-the-art models have exceeded human-level performance on both glue and superglue. These benchmarks are used to show how well a pre-trained natural language processing model performs across several downstream NLP tasks. That's the last data set we intend to review, and so consequently, that concludes the deep learning review.